So there's a reason, right? A reason why we celebrate and, and worship and, and kind of get excited for December. It's not the presence, right? Hopefully, even though that's, that's, a, that's a good thing, right? It helps build that anticipation. This time of year, we get excited because we recognize or we should recognize that the, the advent, the coming of Jesus is the beginning of the end. The beginning of the end. So everything leading up to that, there was a reason for. Everything we go through now, there's a reason for. Because God has a plan. And so whether it's a complete and total joy, or at times this uh, this time of year, there can be some sorrow mixed in. We know our Lord has a plan that he's working to accomplish. So Brent asked the question of the of the young ones, and I'll ask a, pretty much the same question. Does God keep his promises? Does God keep his promises? Yes. yes. Unequivocally, yes. And do we believe him? Do we hold on to that? Not, not in a pithy, cheesy, yeah, it's Sunday morning, but... Monday morning, the rest of the week, when we're tired, or when things are going right, we know he is going to keep his promise, and I can rest in that. There was a slide that's up earlier. We're going to keep coming around to this slide, and, and this was in relation to the early part of Jesus' ministry, the Gospel of John, and those who were coming to persecute Jesus finally came to the point to say, you know, we're, we're going to kill him. We need to kill this guy. Not we need to keep giving him a hard time or asking difficult questions. We're done. And Jesus makes a statement to the religious leaders. And it says there, in his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. It says here, for this reason, for this reason, they tried to, all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath by healing on the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, there's a lot we could unpack there. But the beginning part of that, the, the first part, the top part in red is what I want to look at because we usually don't equate uh, what we're going to be talking about today for this reason. We see that God is making himself equal with God. That's crucial. It's important. Invaluable doctrine and truth. But the practical part of that phrase is crucial for this reason. God is always working. Always. He's working at that time. He's working at this time. He's working in you and he's working in me. He's working in world history to accomplish his purpose. The prophets describe this to us. So what is a prophet? If someone asks you, how do you define a prophet? You say, well, a prophet's a guy who kind of tells the future maybe, or maybe just speaks truth. When we look to Scripture and we see How does scripture describe what a prophet is? In the Old Testament, there's three different terms used for prophet. Two of them mean a person who who speaks because they've had a vision, all right? Another term that's used, or the third one, uh, is a person who has witnessed or has testified to something. We get to the New Testament, and it's two Greek words put together, pro and pemi. Pro means before or for something. The pemi means to speak. So this individual is speaking for God about his message or what the Lord wants him to communicate. So a prophet is someone who's speaking the message of God. Whether they received a vision or not, they're speaking the message of God. So we have a, a huge just a grip, a huge number of prophets. From the beginning of 
New Testament, or sorry, Old Testament history. Genesis chapter 12, right? We have all of the creation and the flood account and all kinds of stuff before that. But the very beginning, chapter 12 of Genesis, we see Abraham. And right from there, God calls him a prophet. And there's individuals who were called out in life who were the prophets. And they saw out into the future because God gave them direction. Now, they didn't always have the whole picture. Had a, a, an amazing man uh, who was a professor in Bible school of mine. His name was David Needham. And he would talk about in the book of Isaiah how the Lord would show Isaiah and tell Isaiah what the future had to hold. But it was like looking at a mountain range, right? And if you were to say, hey, Masami, I, go hike to Mount Hood. I'm like, oh, it's not that far. And you're like, yeah, right. Number one. Look at yourself, Masami. Number two, it's a little hike. And it may look like it's right there, but there's quite a few valleys in between to that peak. And sometimes the prophets didn't always get to see what that distance was in between. So they could be speaking about a great event and even the, the coming events to that great event, but not understanding or seeing that there was actually valleys between those subsequent events. How many of you guys have ever driven, not flown, driven to Southern California? Show of hands. Okay, put them up high. You're not done yet. If you've done it more than twice. Ooh, okay. How many of you guys actually drove to Disneyland? Okay. So, you're, maybe if you have daughters, you got your little princess book ready ahead of time, and you're like, ooh, we're going to go get stamps for everyone, and we're going to get to Disneyland. We got from Estacada to Disneyland or Anaheim. So how far? Oh, man, definitely in Oregon. Distance. Okay, I, I'm, I'm in Oregon now. I'm not talking time. In California, you measure everything by time. How long does it take to get from here to here? Oh, about two hours. Less it's rush hour, then it's three and a half. Oh, okay. In Oregon, I learned when I moved here, oh, we, we measure in distance, right? It's a mind change for me. And I was like, what does that mean? It's 25 miles. How long am I going to take to get from here to here? That's what matters. So 1,000 miles is good Oregon, 1,000 miles. Estacada to Anaheim is roughly 1,000 miles, depending on how many stops you have to make with the kids in the car that have the pee-pee dance going, Right? thousand miles that that journey if we could equate that to maybe the experience of some of the prophets from Abraham to the coming of Jesus a, a lot of similar experience right some long straight flat stretches you get to the mountains in southern Oregon you stop it in and out because you can now climb the mountains Right, there's some steep stuff in there. Get through Shasta, wind your way down through Redding, cruise into Northern California, and then you have a decision to make. Do I stay on the five, or do I go 99? Now, it could depend on your history. 99, less cops. <laughs> and if you've driven it before, you know that. CHP, California Highway Patrol, there are fewer cops on 99, but that road is way worse, and there's, it's much more narrow. But I-5, people tend to drive faster, you got more lanes, and you just got to worry about the CHP a little bit. So you have a decision to make. Prophets spoke in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom throughout history, right, as Things are moving along, but they're proclaiming the same message. Come back in a right relationship with the Lord because he is coming. He's coming. The things you've gone through in the past, they're difficult, they're hard, but he's coming. And you keep cruising down, and let's say you decide to go down the five because it's a holiday weekend, and you know what? You know that 
the 99 is going to get backed up because of all the dorks that are leaving their colleges and heading home. All right? In California. So you stay on the five. And you keep going. But whether you went on the five or you went on the 99, the first 900 miles of that journey are relatively easy. Because there's one event that's coming upon you about the 900-mile mark that you are keenly aware of, especially if you've made that journey more than once. What happens about 900 miles into the drive? Where do you come to? L.A. But before you get to L.A., there's, there's this area you must traverse, the grapevine. Everyone knows the grapevine once you've done it once. Now, you may have hit it at night, right? Because you may be intelligent, well-prepared parents who say, put the kids to bed. And while they're asleep, I'm hitting the hammer down, and we're going for it. And, of course, they're not going to sleep. Um, but you were well-meaning. And you see the grapevine at night, and it, it looks beautiful because the lights are going up. And you can see the very beginning of it. And, man, this is just an attractive thing. It's just Wonderful. And now there's actually a little strip mall beforehand. You can go to Red Robin if you want or buy some clothes at the outlet store. But frankly, if, if dad's behind the wheel and you got the one track mind going, you know what's ahead. You just want to get the job done. Right? But more likely than not, because your kids are in school, you hit the grapevine in the middle of summer or the beginning of summer at least. It's not snow you have to worry about. And if for you truck drivers out there, we know you're not coming down at that point. You're going up because there's lots of emergency exits on the way down the grapevine. You have a short five-mile, 1,600-foot climb at 6% grade. Now, it doesn't sound that bad because most of us have probably driven out past Pendleton and we got our own climb going east. But there's something psychological about that journey, which is because there's a physical aspect to it. Near the coming of Jesus, even though they're not written prophets, there were a number of great prophets that spoke early on in Jesus' ministry. And it's like that steep climb that's coming. Now this climb, as you get ready to make it, you pass the shops and the stores and you start the incline. And pretty quickly, if it's the summertime and you hit it in the heat of the day, you're going to begin to see cars trying to get over to the right. right. I've been in one of the cars trying to get over to the right through the semis because as that heat gauge starts going up, you're like, my beater's not going to make it. Right? And there's regular number of emergency phones with a yellow box, blue sign. They actually have water jugs, 55-gallon jugs out or gallons of water on the side of the road stationed periodically for all the cars that are overheating. All right? Now, you may be in a nice car. And if you're in a nice car... Sure, I've taken it my mom's Mercedes before, and I have little concern but two. Number one, CHP again. <laughs> Who's there? But number two, my other concern isn't about the highway patrol going too fast. It's about the person going too slow in front of me in the left-hand lane. That has an Oregon license plate. <laughs> right? So this climb, it comes. And, and when you think you finished it, when those prophets even did their responsibility, they proclaimed faithfully all that God had called them to do, you think you get to the top of Tihon Pass and it levels out and you're good. But there's actually so much more after that. When I had my old Land Cruiser, that's when it started kicking out the oil and this nice plume of smoke came out behind it from all the burning oil. 
right? You still got to get up the other grades. You got to get to the summit point. You got to get past Pyramid Lake that's carved out a mountain and dropped into the lake. And then when you finally drop down in and you can see the city in front of you, it's actually not over. Because then you still have 80 miles, 70 miles of traffic, chaos, people. Not like Oregon. I'm going to turn my signal on and let you know, hey, I'd like to move over. I'm turning my signal on. This is what I'm going to do whether you're ready or not. Right? You're like, you know what? Maybe, maybe the stamp from the princess isn't that important. You know what? We just hit Valencia, and there's Magic Mountain right here. And instead of Disney characters, we have Looney Tunes. Right? Bigger roller coasters, maybe a little more appealing. But we'll look forward to making the journey and finishing the journey. So press on. The prophets, in that exact same way, had different areas of that journey to press on and press through and, and keep going with. And it was hard. But they kept one consistent, regular thing before their eyes. We can relate to them. Because as they had that hope that the Messiah would come, we have the same hope that he did come and he's going to finish what he said he was going to do. Amen? 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 Amen. So let's talk about four of these prophets. Just four. Okay, there's many we can choose from, but we're going to talk about four. And the first one's the first prophet that's intentionally spoken by God as the prophet Abraham. 4,000 years ago, a herdsman called in his later years in life. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, reads as this. Yahweh had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to land I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. I'll be a blessing. And sorry, and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Famous passage, right? But again, one of the first big prophecies the Lord makes actually to Abraham. Does God keep his promises? Yes. So let's see, how did he do that? So look at Acts chapter 3. And if you plan on flipping through your Bibles today, you're going to be a marathon runner and you're going to hopefully have your thumbs hurt a little bit. Because we had some Genesis, we're going to go all the Revelation on stuff. And we're going to get out on time today. Oh yeah. <laughs> Acts chapter 3. How do we see this fulfilled? Let me read this. And you are heirs of the prophets. And the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples of the earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you, turning each of you from your wicked ways. Now, Abraham spoke that 4,000 years earlier than this statement that's made in the book of Acts that Luke writes down for us. Because God made a promise. He said he was going to bless all the people on the earth. God wanted to give his greatest to us. Right. Chase and I were talking in India a little bit with the rest of the team when we were over there, and we were talking about the greatest. What is the greatest thing God could possibly do for you? Uh, and and you, you can speak, you can be quiet, it doesn't matter. But as you take a moment think, what's the greatest thing he could possibly do for you? It is not pay off your house, right? Yeah. Genesis said, lay down his life. If God is the greatest being ever, 
There's no one greater or higher. When he, when he goes to swear, he doesn't say, I swear on my mother's grave. He says, I swear on my great name. Because there's no one higher. There's nothing higher. He says, I want to give you myself. I want to be in relationship with you. There's nothing greater he can give us. Think about when you got married, like, hey, the greatest person that I could be in relationship with, you know, it, it's my wife. I want to spend the rest of my life with her, right? Like, this, is, this is what I want to make this commitment to. You think the Lord has any less of a desire? It's even greater. He's like, your wife, I'm going to give you me. And your wife's like, yeah, I'm pretty awesome, but hey. He's he's God. God wants to give you the greatest thing possible, that relationship with him. And so he gave us a son, as Jenna said. And so God is fulfilling his promise. When we celebrate here at Christmas the coming of Jesus, it's because God's keeping his promise. So let's fast forward a little bit. 1,200 years later, 800 years before the coming of Jesus, plus or minus 750 years, something like that. Isaiah, in two different statements, writes this. Chapter 42 says, I, Yahweh, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. He continues on a few chapters later and says, He says, or the Lord says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob, than to bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. So how does he accomplish that? Mary is told by Gabriel she's going to have a baby. And she says, what? I'm the Lord's servant. And she packs up really quickly and she goes over to her relative Elizabeth, who when Mary comes to the door, the baby in Elizabeth's womb, six months old, leaps in her womb. And Elizabeth says, why am I so blessed that the mother of my Lord should come and see me? And Mary stays with her, and Elizabeth's husband, Zachariah, has a vision, sees an angel, doesn't believe, can't talk until their baby is born. And everyone trips out at the events that surround that, right? Because it's extraordinary. And Scott will talk about that in a couple of weeks, about all that surrounded John the Baptist. But at that same time, Joseph who's known or learned that the woman he's betrothed to has become pregnant, is visited by that same angel. He said, don't don't be afraid to take her. She's pregnant by the Spirit. And so it says in the Gospel of Luke and Matthew that at that point, Mary returned home. They eventually have to head down south. But before that, um, well, they head down south, but while they're there, Mary has her baby. Angels come, and we'll talk about that next week. Shepherds worship. No wise men, all right? No wise men yet. But in the the timeline of things, something pretty extraordinary takes place. Mary and Joseph keep the law. And they head over to the temple because after they've had all these extraordinary events, they've been visited by angels. They've had shepherds come and, and, and be amazed at the message that angels brought to them. And eight days later, Mary and Joseph make it to the temple. 
And they have eight-day-old baby Jesus. It's their first son, so they have to sacrifice. And then they don't have money. So it says, for those who are poor, Scripture says they can have, they, instead of the bigger sacrifice, they can offer two small lamb, um, doves. So with doves in hand, eight-year-old, or eight-day-old baby Jesus, they're walking to make their sacrifices, and they get to the temple courts, and God has led a man named Simeon. Eight days old. And this man has been waiting for what Scripture calls the consolation of Israel. The encouragement, the comforting for Israel. And God has given this man, Simeon, a vision. Right? He spoke to him. He said, you know what? You will not pass away until you see the consolation of Israel. And it says the Spirit of God was on Simeon. And as Mary and Joseph are walking with their pigeons and their eight-day-old, they're headed toward the court, and Simeon comes, and he intercepts them. And he says he takes baby Jesus in his hands. And he says, now, now, I can die. Because I've seen God's promise. You read it here. We'll start in verse 27. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when his parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of of all nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Does God keep his promise? Yes. He is beginning the end. The end is a good thing. Not the end of your existence, not the end of all the things that are amazing in God's creation, but the end of sin, the end of death, the end of everything that was not supposed to be. So let's look to one of the other great prophets. Just for Jesus to come was not enough. To be born as a baby, for Simeon to see this consolation, the encouragement, he also knew the prophecy that something difficult was going to have to happen. And the prophet Moses, 600 years before Isaiah even, spoke. Now, each of these prophets, I said, came from a different background. Isaiah was of royal family, maybe a cousin to the king. Moses, born a slave into a slave family, but through the extraordinary circumstances we all know, right? He, he ended up living with royalty, the Egyptian royalty, and then had to flee and become a shepherd. So about the 80-year mark in his life, the Lord says, okay, it's time for me to free my people. And as Moses wrote the book of Numbers, there was an event that took place, right, with sin among the people of God. And so snakes came out and bit the people, and many began to die. But the Lord prompted Moses, and he fashioned a serpent onto a staff and held it up and said, if you look on this, when you are bitten, you will not die. Right, foreshadowing the man who would take sin upon himself on a massive wooden beam and putting our faith in him, we don't have to die. So, Numbers 
recounts that brief summary right there, recounts that event. And Jesus says, you know what, I know I'm going to have to do this. So when we flash forward to the book of John, chapter 3, Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Jesus knew why he came. It wasn't for the fanfare in the beginning of his life, which is completely appropriate. It was for the purpose of God giving his greatest thing to us, a restored relationship of man with God. Let's look at one more. One more prophet. Micah. A farmer, even a yeoman or a plowman, called out, pretty normal guy, like, a strong, big heart for his people. About the same time as Isaiah, Micah prophesied, and Micah or Isaiah prophesied among the royalty mostly and in Jerusalem around the temple, but Micah, he was out with the people. He was called out to proclaim God's plan for Israel and all the nations because God said he was going to do it. He had a plan, he's going to accomplish it. The coming redeemer is born a baby. But even though he's a baby, he's going to be of old. Which must have sound very cryptic. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says, But you, Bethlehem of Ephraim, though you are small among the, day, the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler over Israel, whose origins are, from old, are of old, from ancient times. Now, Jesus himself speaks to this one. Right? There's a, a good-sized section in John. There's, there's a lot more throughout other places, but we're just going to read a few verses in, in John. If you have your Bible, it's the one I'm going to ask you to flip open to. Chapter 8 of John. Begin in verse 48, and we'll read 10 verses or so. The Jews answered him, Jesus, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Jesus responded, verse 49, I am not possessed by a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking it. I'm sorry. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this, they exclaimed, now we know you're demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died. So did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. And though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father, Abraham, rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You're not yet 50 years old, they said to him. And you've seen Abraham? Very truly, I say to you. Sorry, wrong translation. Stuck in the head. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Pretty amazing statement. Abraham looked forward to my day. Jesus is speaking back to the days of the first prophet and all of the subsequent about all the prophets that look forward to his coming. 
because he was there. God has a plan. The Lord is still working like it says in John chapter 5. The Lord is at work till this day. He's still moving. And he's working in our lives to accomplish his purpose. And whether we want to submit to that or not, he's still going to do it. A plan, a promise. We're nearing our destination. There are still some steep hills to climb before we get to home. And we get to sit down at the wedding supper of the Lamb, which is a little bit better than having my book stamped by the princesses. We have some time to reflect this time of year, to be encouraged, hopefully to grow in our relationship with the Lord. I want to remind you to be resolved, regardless of what our culture says, to praise him. He came to initiate the conclusion of the plan to show that in time he will set everything right. But some still ask this question as they did back in Peter's day. Where is his coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But verse 5 says this in 2 Peter. But they deliberately forget. Right, all the events of early creation and the flood, that God does what he says he's going to do. Paul implores us that even though we know he's coming, I don't want you to be ignorant to this mystery, brothers and sisters, so they may be, you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. God still has a plan, and there's a reason he is holding off on returning. Un- <laughs> yeah. He, he's not coming back for a reason. Why? And you're, you're mulling it over because you know the answer in your head. He's intentionally holding off because in his plan, there are those that he's called to himself and he's like, hey, we're, we're not done. There are more brothers and sisters that are coming. So until that full number is there, I'm not bringing the end. And even those in heaven, not not long from now, are going to be crying out. In Revelation chapter 6, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? And then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Now, that's the prophetic aspect, right? That's a future event still. But there there is those, there are those who are called, God has a plan, and we need to just be faithful, right? We read the book of Revelation And it's not for us to be scared about. It's for us to be encouraged by. The plan has a conclusion. Its author knows what it is. And we need to trust him in it. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, this may sound difficult. In fact, this is almost like a, a, forgive me, teachers, like a math problem where you don't know what X is. Right? Right? You've had those math problems. You're like, what is X? If you tell me what X is, I'll figure out how to get there. Well, let me tell you the equation first, right? So you could be in working it out. Jesus came in fulfillment of the plan because he loves us. He wants to give us the greatest thing possible. And if you haven't, What you need to do is this. Repent, meaning this. Ask God to forgive you. Admit, I I sin. 
I do what God doesn't want me to do. I rebel. But I want to be forgiven. God, I want you to forgive me. And you ask him to forgive you. And here's the amazing thing. God tells us what he's like. He says, a broken and contrite heart I cannot resist. I will not resist. If you say that to him and if you mean it, he says that he will not resist you. And he'll call you in the right relationship. And he'll restore you. And he'll forgive you. And then he will have his spirit live in you and prompt you and lead you. So that when this end stuff and things are finally set right, finally draws to its end conclusion, you have a lot more peace and even excitement about what is to come. So whether you are a believer, I hope you're tremendously encouraged that the plan is continuing on and you are a part of it. If you don't believe yet, I I implore you, I, I beg you, please. Believe the words, not of me, but what scripture says, because that's what matters. He gave us something to remember that by. He said that I'm going to do this, I'm going I'm to die on the cross, but I'm going to rise again. And I want you to remember that regularly, together. And so he gave us something to remember it by when we're together. Communion. It says in the Gospels, you can read in Corinthians, Romans, it says that the Lord took bread with his disciples and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat of it. And after they had spent some time together, he took a cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it. And remember me when you do. He says that also, he will not drink it again, and he drinks it anew with us when we get home. He says it's a new covenant in my blood. The Lord initiated something for us, an anticipation that we should live and have with excitement. Christmas Eve night, morning, whenever you open up your presents, little guys, that is nothing compared to the excitement that is ours when we're at the wedding supper of the Lamb and we're sitting there and, and <laughs> with Jesus. And the prophets are there. And your family who's believed, they're there. And we're home. And the tears have been wiped. Everything's set right. It'll be a great day. One, again, it's just of many to come and doesn't end. Amen? So, yeah, clap because there's victory there. (laughs) So here at First Baptist, um, we don't like pass the cup and plate uh, around. We have you come up when you're ready. The worship team is going to come back up on the stage. Um, They're going to play some worship songs, and we're going to sing and praise the Lord together. And as you're ready with your family, um, yourself, you can come take the bread and the drink. And if you want to step out and explain with your kids, your family, pray together, however you choose to do that, go for it. Okay? Let me pray for us, and uh, we'll remember the Lord's plan. Father, thank you for being good. Lord, and we don't say that because it's, um, it's easy. You said when a rich man came and asked you and said that you're a good teacher. You said no one's good but the Father alone. And, and you know what, Lord? We, we know you are one with the Father, so we know that you're good. Lord, we want to ask right now that you who did everything perfectly, who loved us, who kept this plan going and in motion, you loved me. You love those who are yours, who are sitting here. You love those who who don't know you yet, who are sitting here. You love them with a love that is not even comprehensible to anybody in this room or this world. 
and you died for us. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for taking my sin, taking our sin on yourself. But thank you for also overcoming victory and rising from the dead so that we know we have that exact same hope. As we spend time remembering your sacrifice for us, encourage us, Father. Because we know your plan, your promise is unshakable. It's unbreakable. And so we magnify you because of that. We love you and ask this all in Jesus' name.